Hello YouTube, today we're going to do a debate review and analysis. We've got Loner Box versus Lauren Southern. I actually met Lauren Southern briefly once at a Libertarian meetup in Vancouver. This must have been back in 2014, 2015. The issue of immigration is a very contentious one among Libertarians as of late. There's a very sharp division between open borders Libertarians and those who are in favor of restricting immigration to some degree. The none other than Dave Smith uh, recently dismissed open borders libertarians as loons or something. I, f I forget the exact verbiage. Anyway, I'm excited to hear the arguments. Uh, let's get right into it. The whole thing, but what about my commentary on the first half? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I only caught the last few minutes. I was in like another part of the house doing stuff, but um, okay, no yeah, worries. Um, I was, I was like, I only asked to call because you skipped over the pit where I said that the lead up to the interview. Yeah, I went. Someone asked me to go I back. Didn't think and I didn't. The whole, obviously, I saw that you interviewed. I put that in my video. I show you interviewing panels. Yeah. So, um, so like, what did you yeah, think actually, went, went on there? Like, what did you think was happening? Did you think we were like, I just like, faking okay, it um, all? my, uh, well, no, my sister is a journalist. I know mm -hmm. that people do film stuff after the fact. I just thought the whole, like the evidence board and the, uh, like the shipping app stuff. I just, and like the porn acting, I just thought that was kind of funny, you know? But like you um, introduced it as Lauren Southern is a lying f fake journalist. Well, what I thought with that When you was just said, you know, your sister does this and people set up shots. Well, they don't they don't build fake evidence boards like three weeks later. That's that's something I think that's maybe limited to the alternative media. It, it wasn't a fake evidence board, though. It was just an evidence board that was on the wall that we actually did end up using. It was a bit of a I mean, prop I'll... for sure, but it wasn't like fake. <laughs> OK, I'll take your word. So uh, about um, Panos's lawyer. Yep. Um, saying the phrase we were laundering it. Yep. You have the full footage of that. I can get it. Yeah, it's all on hard drives. I, they're actually they would be hard drives in London, not here, since my. Because I'm just one. I'm, I'm, and I'm, I'm not. I'm just very uh, intrigued about the idea of a lawyer who would like admit that. He well, was he didn't know it. He, he didn't. Stranger. He had no idea he was being recorded. Obviously. Yeah, but even just speaking to a total stranger as a lawyer, like you'd think well, you'd know better. Of course, there was a, and I, I won't lie about this. There's obviously with journalism, and this has happened to me the other way around, where I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I thought this person was actually sympathetic to me. There's a degree of, you have to be like, yes, I'm super sympathetic, otherwise people won't be honest. Unfortunately. Yeah. So what I was thinking with, um, so is there more clarification? off that recording because the, the two big things I felt that were very missing from that um, interview with the lawyer was no clarifying question. So him following. This isn't a debate at all. It's like a discussion. Of course, I have zero idea what they're talking about, like the context. Hopefully it gets a bit more animated as we go on up saying we we were laundering it we don't know if that's him describing the charges right or actually oh, okay. saying, I, you know what i'm gonna i'm know, gonna we ask my all of the all i do not have it on my computer here the hard drives with all of that footage on it um when we were traveling so we went to turkey where we had all of our stuff confiscated that was uh, after our trip to greece we were literally mailing hard drives back to london where my editors were throughout our trip i didn't take any of them home I was sent edited copies of the film, full uh, full transcripts, and usually. Uh, why wouldn't you just like use Dropbox or Google Drive or something and transmit the footage electronically like that? I mean, there's no way it's cheaper. Maybe if you don't have access to a high-speed upload in Turkey, that could be an issue. I'm not sure what the internet situation is like there. Usually we would do, um, uh, like, you know how when you open Discord, you can do a screen share with editing and watching and cutting. We do that. So I don't own all of the footage on my own hard drive. I have obviously all the final copies, but I can absolutely request and source that if you want. 
more context. Yeah, um, so it'll probably take me I just, did you, uh, a minute, but I'm did you happy edit to do that. that. Video? Did you edit that video? Um, yeah, I was part of the video. editing for sure. And well, it's, been, it's been like three would... years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I'm not going to I'm not gonna try to put you on, your, on the spot or anything. No, no, no. Like, I'm happy why, to actually like... source it because I, I know for a fact we wouldn't misportray anything to that degree, um, especially... Yeah, because in the video, instead of a clarifying question, because, again, that is one thing I know that journalists are supposed to do. I'm sure you'd agree. You're supposed to ask... Because he asks Panos the clarifying question. He asks, can I just clarify, you categorically deny the charges. He has mm -hmm. to make him say it twice with mm -hmm. the question preceding it. Whereas all I hear is, I think it's Kaylin's voice going, what? As in like, just making up like, a, like almost just a grunt. So that's not, there is no clarifying question. And we, we don't know the lawyer's name. Yeah, so okay, George, George was yeah. talking to him off to the side. Um, but yeah, I can, I can go and grab the full footage because I have no doubt in my mind that that is exactly what he said. And you know what? Uh, uh, did you end up going over the Ariel Ricker footage as well in your film, in your little video? Um, no, I think Jose, the YouTuber, had already covered that to kind of an extent, and it wasn't, it kind of was relevant to NGOs, but this was, uh, most of my data was specifically right. NGOs in the central Mediterranean. Not, okay, so yeah, because like, it's, it's no that. secret that, like, these NGOs are often partaking in sketchy activities, especially after talking to Ariel Ricker, she was like, yeah, absolutely, we have people that you know, go and take jet skis across the water. We call them angels and they grab people and bring them over. Uh, we absolutely are training people how to get refugee status, pretending they're Christian and persecuted because as you know, you even mentioned it in your video, Turkey is a refugee safe country. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm very curious, what country in particular are Christians getting persecuted and that Muslims aren't? Well, Turkey is majority Islamic, so that's what the claim would be coming from because it's really difficult, obviously. When when I was in um, Lesbos, there's a place called the uh, Life Jacket Graveyard, and it's we, we put footage of it. It's just like hundreds, thousands of life jackets in a pile from people who have just landed on the shore. Here's from Lauren's Wikipedia page. In May 2017, Southern, along with Martin Sellner and Brittany Pettibone, took part in an attempt organized by the identitarian group Generation Identaire to block the passage of an NGO ship, the Aquarius, uh, claiming the goal of the activist was to stop an empty boat from going down to Libya filling up with illegal migrants. Southern was briefly detained by the Italian Coast Guard. So Lauren Southern to me has always seemed to be sort of flirting with the edge of outright white nationalism. There don't seem to be a lot of elements of libertarian thought in her worldview. I don't know, maybe it's just a reaction against multiculturalism and identity politics. And in it, you can find people's documents like partially burned or thrown away. And typically that's because they've been told by traffickers or by NGOs, you can't have your documentation on you because you can be deported if you have your passport and you've come from like a non-refugee country. Um, or if you've already got refugee status, obviously you're gonna be sent back because it's like, no, you're already, you can't country shop. You've already been given yeah, safe yeah, that, asylum. No, so no, that, we, that's, that's what I'm right. saying is we found like refugee papers for Turkey in this pile. Yeah, so what I'm asking about is the thing with the Christians thing, because like I know, well, the main refugee countries, I suppose, where there's like Christian, Christians being persecuted would be Nigeria, right? Because of um, uh, Boko Haram. That's why that's like the main country where like a persecuted Christian under a Muslim regime would come from. But then I don't know why you would have to say you're Christian to prove you're persecuted because Muslims get persecuted by Boko Haram as well. Well, no, this is in Turkey. They're claiming in Turkey I face persecution for whatever reason. Um, so this is people coming from Turkey. So they're not necessarily saying it's going to stick, but your your chances of getting a refugee status after... Tra Turkey really doesn't strike me as a country with a lot of political or uh, religious repression. So they do have that whack job president dictator guy Erdogan traveling through Turkey. Well, uh, the claim could be you, like, as a persecuted Christian from X country, I don't feel hmm. safe in a majority Muslim country again. I need to come to Europe. Uh, you don't, well, you don't actually need to prove that you're, 
you know, you don't need to stay in the first safe country you arrive in, though. That's not the law. So you can country shop? Is that um, like, can you, can, really... you, can you cite where that comes from? Well, I'm just saying what the, well, it's, a, it's the United Nations uh, Convention on Refugees. Can you read that? Like, I... Just after a quick Google search, there is no requirement coming from Amnesty International for refugees to claim in the first safe country. The United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, there is no requirement under international law for asylum seekers to seek refuge in the first safe country. Now, there is an agreement between Canada and the United States, which says uh, the Safe Third Country Agreement uh, is part of the U.S.-Canada Smart Border Action Plan and refugee claimants are required to request refugee protection in the first safe country they arrive in unless they qualify for an exception to the agreement. Uh, also, okay, there is a common misconception. I'll find it. It's, I thought was it Article 30. What, my notes for this are enormous. Because um, all of the, all of the uh, you know, certainly I've gone to the European Union a couple times and spoken to people who are policymakers on this, and that was one of the number one contentions that was always spoken about by policymakers yeah, was the so problem of country within, shopping. So within Europe, there is the Dublin regulation, uh, which says uh, you don't have to stay in the first safe country, but it might it'll probably harm your claim if you do. But that's within Europe. But that's within Europe, so that's, right? Um, so that doesn't yeah, include so Turkey. Yeah, so not for, doesn't include Turkey. And even the thing within Europe, you could say the United Nations still has a problem with that because uh, the whole logic of saying you don't have to stay in the first safe country is you're just putting a very arbitrary burden on whichever country is next door right like the fact that if you're if the nearest safe country is a country of like five million people and they're massively in debt then it would make sense as an international community to allow people there to move onwards so that's why the idea of safe third countries and i've mentioned this in the video as well but mm -hmm. I'll there's I'll also the, the thing. yeah so that's the thing about for, i'm trying to find this in, um where is it because I um, obviously that really does. Um, that's one thing that I spoke to a lot of migrants about when I was on the ground. They were like, man, we really and I, we didn't film all of it because obviously a ton of migrants told us like, no, we're not comfortable being on footage. We don't want to be filmed. And we respected that. We really made sure we only um, filmed people, especially if they were migrating and potentially, you know, escaping a violent regime in some cases, because I do believe genuine refugees exist within that. Well, I think the majority are um, typically just migrating for economic reasons. Um... Dancing a pretty fine line here between, oh my God, the coming Muslim hordes and I, I heart refugees. I mean, whether they're economic migrants or quote unquote legitimate refugees, like who gives a shit? These are people escaping autocratic regimes looking for a better life. Why not just be compassionate and, and welcome them into, into first world countries? I mean, I'm a huge proponent of increased immigration. I think that there's so many people in the third world who would benefit from uh, having access to uh, first world labor markets our economy can can use the influx of of unskilled workers, of people that are are eager and willing to work hard for a reasonable wage. And down the road, these workers are going to become skilled workers, entrepreneurs, husbands and wives, mothers and fathers. I mean, we're already below replacement in a lot of countries anyway. Canada certainly has a very low birth rate. A lot of the immigrants end up uh, sending money back home to their families, which is sort of like a free foreign aid that's targeted towards where it's gonna do the most good. Like, so what if, if some um, NGO operatives are bending the rules a little? Sometimes when you're stuck within a senseless bureaucratic system you have to bend the rules a little just just to make the whole thing work and when we we were talking to people off camera that didn't necessarily want to be filmed they were often quite often telling us like man 
like, yeah, we were really screwed over being told we could actually get refugee status in these countries. We were really screwed over being given this false information that we were going to be given somewhere to live, be given asylum, because we're being told we're illegal migrants, especially because the traffickers will tell them to destroy their passports so they actually have no way to even apply. And, and to be fair to the governments, how are you supposed to give refugee status to someone who has no ability, isn't from a refugee, you know, de designated country, has no ability to prove who they are, and has zero ability to prove what their background is, or even their yeah, identity. Yeah, okay, so, I, like, I cover, I mean, I cover that as well, like, I, there are supposed to be, um, there are supposed to be international laws around assisting people who don't have documents, because there can actually be a few reasons, like, some of it can be, uh, you can be from a country that is absolutely riddled with human rights abuses, but uh, you can be going to a country like Italy, where they consider Libya a safe country, which it absolutely isn't. Okay. So um, yeah, like you can have, uh, but again, like that's uh, that's just more of like kind of a separate issue. I can send you that um, law of, but yeah, that is like something that I covered a little bit as well, but I've sent you the link there. The article in the uh, UN law is contracting states shall not impose uh, shall not impose penalties on account of their illegal entry or presence on refugees who are coming directly from a territory where their life or freedom was threatened. So that's why the term coming directly gets misconstrued, but then there are separate UN articles where they explain that coming directly is based on whether or not they claimed asylum and got settled. So if they claimed asylum and got settled in Turkey, and then destroyed that and tried to go somewhere else, that would be a crime. Okay, that so, would be. yeah, yeah, but yeah. If they just got, but if they just got to Turkey and then decided to move afterwards before claiming asylum, that's fine. Okay, so I see what you mean there, and that actually tends to be a big problem, is they won't actually apply, not as in they won't apply, they'll try, but they won't have the actual background to be able to get refugee status in a country because they, they don't have a genuine claim to it. So then they'll try to country shop and see which country will let them claim it because they don't actually have a claim. And that's that tends to be the pro problem there, which is a big question I wanted to ask you. Do you see a difference between migrants and refugees? And do you think that difference is important? Yeah, I mentioned that as well. Yeah, don't worry. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, um, I'll just, I just thought, So for the, you'll probably notice I feel like I'm just repeating my own script. You'll probably uh, notice that I used migrant and refugee kind of interchangeably yes. in that video. Yeah, because it's a big that's, pet peeve that's of mine. Kind of, it's a pet peeve of mine as well. And it's because that's what they are at sea. You don't know. NGOs can't assess someone's legal state. Even Mare Nostrum didn't have the power to assess legal status of someone they rescued. They take them to the uh, country, whichever they're registered to, or just whichever country respects the dignity of those saved. And then the country decides whether or not they're a refugee or a migrant. So that's why um, you can't really call them either. Which so is why, why do you use refugee then? When you um, I use migrant it's as well. a bit well. biased. <laughs> no, no, I've used both because okay. it is bo it's both. There's, I don't think there's ever been a boat that had 100% no refugees. I don't think I've seen that anywhere. I looked. I don't know, because there would be a lot. I mean, any boat with the majority North Africans which we've seen absolutely would be people that would not have a lot anyways would not have legitimate claim yeah well that, but again the point is the point is here is that we're talking about what happens at sea and the idea is all right so this is just not really contentious enough for me to continue watching i was hoping for more of a debate apparently lawrence southern's on sort of a moderating arc Certainly, just a quick glance at her YouTube videos uh, made in the last year, and they seem uh, a little less overtly ethno-nationalist. Be interesting to uh, keep an eye on the content she's making in coming years. So this was a discussion between Loner Box, who I believe he's a bread tuber, and Lauren Southern. And again, I thought it was going to be a debate. And I'd be doing debate analysis, but I was wrong. <laughs>